Good morning, Emmanuel Church, and welcome to our worship service on September 20th. It's so good to be here with you as we get to worship together once again. And still, you know what? Today is um, three weeks already into September. Can you imagine that? But we're going to have a great time to worship. And also, let's not forget, it's congregational meeting later on today as well, too. So let me open us in a word of prayer. Oh, one last reminder. Today is also Communion Sunday. So if you want to take a moment to grab your elements um, before we begin to worship, you're welcome to do that. Any kind of bread, roll, dinner roll, uh, red juice, purple juice (laughs) of some sort or wine, you're most welcome to uh, use those as elements to represent the body and blood of Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for um, this worship opportunity that we have with each other. We pray, Father, that you would draw hearts near to you. And we pray, Father, God, that we would be free to lay our burdens before you. We ask, God, that we would experience your presence with us as we are having church right now, wherever we are at. And we are united, not physically, but spiritually in your Holy Spirit. We offer our worship to you, God, this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. voices together in praise to the only one who is worthy of our worship and our adoration. Let's sing out now to our great God and King.
the Lord. Well, welcome to worship, everyone. Our desire today is that we can help usher you in to the throne of grace to come before the Lord in worship to him, the only one, as we said, that we will adore, that we will give our worship and adoration to. And we just hope that you'll take this opportunity to truly engage in this time and not just observe, but sing along either audibly or in your mind as a prayer, but that you'll really be a part of lifting these praises up to the Lord. It's tough not being together, but we're glad we get to at least join together virtually. And with that, we have to work hard to stay connected. And you know the different ways you can do that through our website, through the Facebook page, especially the Facebook group, Emmanuel Church Burbank. And you can really keep up with everything important that's going on by reading the Tuesday afternoon Emmanuel News and also the Friday afternoon pastoral letters. So if you're not getting those, be sure to email info at emmanuelburbank.org to get on that mailing list to get those important emails. So today is a very important day in the life of our church. It is our annual congregational meeting. That meeting is taking place today on Zoom. So right after the service, you're gonna wanna head over to Zoom. And this morning, before the service started, you should have received an email from Pastor Bob. And in that email, there was a link for the, the Zoom link for the congregational meeting. And there was another link in there that is how you can vote for the elders and how you can approve the budget. So make sure to find that email. The Zoom link is also in the Tuesday Emanuel News and it is over on the Facebook group if you need it that way as well. But be sure to attend the congregational meeting today. It's how you can make sure you know everything that's going on. And it's just important that we all get on the same page as often as possible. And this is one of those great opportunities. So today at 11 on Zoom. Um, at this point, we are planning to have our outdoor worship gathering tonight at 6.30 p.m. If you would like to attend, make sure that you RSVP to info at emmanuelburbank.org by 4 p.m. This is weather permitting and this is air quality permitting. So if you RSVP to this and it happens to be canceled for any reason, you will get an email directly to you since we have your email address from RSVPing. So you might wanna check in one last time on email before you head over, but we're hoping everything will be fine for today. You must RSVP and masks are also required and note that it is a time change. We'll be getting that service at 6.30 p.m. tonight. Also today, we'll be sharing communion together. So as Pastor Brian mentioned a few minutes ago, if you have not yet prepared your elements, please do so so that we can partake together later on. We are not having a live seven minute mixer today, but we are having all of our other usual uh, after church service ministries, even though the annual meeting is going on. We're still having the 10 a.m. children's ministry the 11 a.m. Uh, high school group, and the 11.30 middle school group. And again, all of those Zoom links are in the Emmanuel News. With that, let's continue now with an attitude of worship through singing, through praying, through the teaching of God's word, even through our offering, and through communion that we'll share together in a little while. Let's offer all of this up as worship to our great God. And as we do, let's focus on these words in Be Thou My Vision that ask God to help us see things the way he sees them. That ask God to help us know how to serve in the ways that he wants us to, how to help, how to share his good news and to be a part of his kingdom work. Lord, hear these praises that we bring to you now. Receive this offering, this sacrifice of praise. And Lord, thank you that as we give you the glory and honor that you are due, you speak to us and you refill us and refresh us by your grace. We're here to give to you, but in your kindness and your goodness, you 
give to us and how we thank you. Lord, hear us as we sing to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Goodness of God. 
as we sing of God's goodness. I know there are so many ways each of us can count that we know of his goodness. But I think of something else too when I think of that word, goodness. God, he bestows goodness, but he also is goodness. He is only good. He can't be bad. He can't do bad. It's not possible because he's made of pure good. I also think about his greatness, all he's created, all he has done. He is all-knowing, he is all-seeing. He is beyond what we can even fathom. And we as his children get to know who we are because of him and his goodness and greatness. I'm going to invite you one more time to come before the Lord now, if you haven't already, with your whole heart. Surrender to him now. Humble yourself before him and give him the worship and adoration he is due by singing of his greatness now.
Amen, you guys. It's so good to be able to worship together wherever we're at, join in the Holy Spirit together. Um, we are covering our final message for the first core value of Emmanuel Church. And to start off, what I'd like to do is to take you through an exercise. It's a short little brief exercise. So if you have something to write on, a piece of paper, your um, smartphone or a tablet, um, you can join in on this exercise uh, with whatever you have. Uh, the first is you can see this chart that's up here on the screen. And what I'd like you to do is think of someone you love and write that person's name down on the left-hand column. Okay? Think of somebody you love. It could be anyone. Spouse, parents, kids, boyfriend, girlfriend, best friend, someone that you love. Now, once you have that person's name down, I want you to think of in the middle, for the middle column, what are some of the practical ways in which you exercise your love for this person? How do you practically exercise your love for this person? Jot down a few notes for yourself. They don't have to be full sentences. As long as you understand what it is, that's all that matters. So it could be a word, a phrase for that note. After you've taken a moment to do that and to consider the ways in which you exercise love for this person, on the right-hand column, I'd like you to consider what are some of the potential competitions or challenges for your love of this person? What potentially competes or challenges you in your love of this person? So they could be things like things that draw your attention away, things that draw your time or energy away, uh, distractions or other priorities perhaps that compete for your ability to love this person, or even your own vices, character flaws or poor habits that might get in the way. Maybe could it be workaholism, selfishness, or even temptations? What are some of those things that you can honestly think of that may compete with your love for this person? Would you jot down some notes for yourself on the right-hand column? As you take time to think through this, it might be kind of revealing to see that there are things in life that compete um, with our love for someone. Things that may always try to take um, time or, or practical resources away from us that hinders our ability to express or exercise love for somebody. Or maybe it's um, things that compete in such a way that may uh, compromise the level of quality of love that we can express or exercise for someone. What we're looking at today in this third message, in the final message for the first core value, there are five core values we have, and we're covering the first one on personal flourishing. And what we're looking at are connections. Connections are important. How one thing connects to another, and in some cases, how things connect to other things that we didn't even expect. And you see, the thing with connections are, is that they reveal insights insights to us about relationships between things, insights to us about how things work together, connections. In our series here, we're going to be looking at some connections in this final message about personal flourishing. This is that final message, and as Emmanuel strives for the personal flourishing of every person, we're going to look in this message how Jesus offers us three connections shows us three connections in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24. Matthew 6, 19 to 24. Would you join me there in your Bibles? And as you turn to Matthew 6, I'd like to open us in a word of prayer as we get into God's Word. Heavenly Father God, Lord, we pray, Father, that you are with us. We pray, Father God, that you would uh, walk us through your Word. Show us the connections that Jesus is revealing to us through this passage. And we pray, God, that you ignite in us a passion and a hunger for your word. Let us feed on it, Father, and let it be food to our souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24, and it reads, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and their thieves, and where thieves break in and steal. 
But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness! No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You know, this third message for personal flourishing is so important to us. See, in the, the last message, we talked about growth and change, how growth and change is necessary for personal flourishing. In the previous message to that, we talked about what it meant to be truly alive in Jesus Christ. And now in this message here, Jesus reveals to us three connections that says a lot about our heart and is key to human flourishing. And he talks about treasures initially. In verses 19 to 21, he talks about treasures. And now let me lay a picture for us when it comes to this idea of treasures to explain what he would have been referring to from the first century perspective. See, treasures in the first century were basically forms of goods and currency. They were actual items and certain amounts of money. Notice that the reference of treasures did not have in mind any particular types of objects. So it's subjective. The treasures is subjective to any, each person. So a poor person and a rich person could have treasures because the, the, the treasure simply had to do with what they valued. For instance, having a gold vase could constitute as treasure, or having one million dollars could constitute as treasure. The treasure thought of in Jesus' time were items or an amount of money that someone held a lot of value in. So Jesus' message here had lots of flexibility in terms of who it could apply to. A poor person could find that his treasure or her treasure was a single tunic or a single cloak or robe. Whereas for a wealthy person, that treasure might be his three camels, his palace, and the equivalent of a million dollars, okay? The second part of what Jesus refers to when it comes to treasures in the first century was that treasures were typically stored. They were either stored in homes or in some safe place that was outside of their home. So when Jesus says, lay up, what you lay up, it literally means what you store, what you store up as treasures. So referring to these physical items, things that can be arranged. And what Jesus challenges us with is where we lay up certain treasures. And he's challenging us to not lay up treasures on earth, but to lay up treasures in heaven. Now, this is going to establish different types of treasures because you can't store up earthly treasures in heaven. You, you can't have uh, save your three camels in heaven. <laughs> you can't save your palace of gold in heaven. Heaven has a different type and set of treasures. So here's one thing though. Jesus is not saying that people cannot have possessions. So let's not get into that misnomer. Jesus is not saying that you can't have money. In fact, in uh, the first century church, there were notable people who were wealthy, who had a lot, who owned property, and it was all about what they did with that, how they exercised Christian virtue exercise Christian character um, through their possessions and their resources. And remember, the way Jesus phrases his teaching, it could be applied to anyone. It could be applied to the wealthy or to uh, the impoverished person. So it wasn't about how, uh, what you had as, or how much you had. Uh, what Jesus meant about laying up treasures, it's about what you value, what you value. They're what we value most. Whatever you deem to be your treasure is what you value most. And that's what Jesus means when he talks about laying up treasures. It's a question of what do you value most in life. And here's the big connection Jesus makes about us. Whatever we value most, that is where our heart is. That's the first most important connection Jesus makes for us. That what we value most, that's where our heart is going to reside. So wherever we lay up our treasures, wherever we store our treasures, our heart's going to be there too because it's about value. It's about what's most important and dear to us. What we draw uh, confidence in or rest our confidence on. 
Jesus is making this connection, meaning that you can't separate the two. These two things are connected. You can't separate what you value and where your heart will be. These two things will inevitably be connected. And here's Jesus' insight on the human soul and how the human soul functions, that your heart will naturally go to what you value, and it's going to reside with what you value. You may say this is important to you, but where your treasure lies, that's where your heart will be. So what should we ultimately value then? Jesus says in verses 19 through 21 that what you should ultimately value has to do with laying up treasures in heaven. Now, this passage here in verses 19 to 24, it follows a previous context, another conversation that took place right before this, and it leads into this passage. So I'm going to take a moment to back up to verse 16 to show us the previous context. In that previous context, it reads, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. This is verse 16. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. See, that's the passage that leads up to our passage. That's the conversation uh, that Jesus has with about religious leaders who are wanting to have public recognition for their spiritual practices so, so that people can see how religious and pious and devout they appear. Uh, so while on one hand they're, they're praying and fasting to God, on the other hand, they want people to notice it. They want applause and praise for their religious piety for their exercise of what seems to be such notable, noble characteristics of themselves. And that leads into this passage here that we have. And so a clue that we get about what are treasures in heaven is where Jesus referred to just previously about God the Father who rewards people. So there's rewards that, that God the Father gives to people. There's rewards that, um, that are given by God the Father for things that we do. Uh, what are those things that we do that would warrant rewards from God the Father? Well, they are spiritual acts that are done with the right motivation. The heavenly treasures are results of godly acts of justice, grace, love, the teaching and the following of truth. All of these things that represent the attributes of God. Uh, these no one can take away. And the true treasures of heaven are the applause of, the, of God the Father towards us for these godly acts that we commit. Not for public gain or public approval, but because of our a genuine heart and how we actually interact with God. That's what earns the rewards from God the Father. Treasures of the heart genuinely are about godly character. If you have money and possessions, what do you do with all those resources? Are they a means for you to exercise godly character and attributes? So the first connection that Jesus makes for us has to do with where the heart lies and what you truly value. The things that are stored up in heaven are rewards from God the Father, and are, is that where you're heart lies ultimately? Are your most valuable uh, possessions laid up in heaven with God, with what God has to offer to you as rewards because of godly character and attributes that you exercise? So there's a question, a question of an orientation of our hearts, where our hearts ultimately lie. And then there's a the second connection as Jesus continues on to verse 22 and 23 where he says the eye is the lamp of the body. So the, the next connection that he makes here is between the eye and the body. The body represents the whole being, mainly our soul. What is the relationship between the eye and the body? Well, Jesus says the eye is like a lamp to the body. Jesus says the eye is like a lamp to the body, meaning it has the ability to shine on the soul. There's a lot of deep metaphor going on here. How does the eye shine on the soul? 
When we think of what the eye does, it sees, it looks at things, and it directs you, right? Uh, most people walk in the direction that they are looking at. <laughs> you know that there's usually problems when people are looking somewhere else and they're walking in another direction. It's, it's kind of like people who have their um, cell phones and they're walking like this. They're likely going to run into somebody, <laughs> you know? And so we generally look at where we are going, right? So the eye it fixes on our targets and our destination and what we are pursuing. That's what the eye does. So it establishes what we are seeking, what we ultimately pursue. What is so valuable to you that it would capture your gaze? What is so valuable to you that it captures your sight? What is so important to you that it maintains your focus? It's kind of like that um, classic scene um, of Abu when he's gazing at this big giant ruby, and he shouldn't be because <laughs> he wasn't supposed to touch anything in, in the Cave of Wonders. Uh, was that the cave? Yeah, the Cave of Wonders. So we fix our sights on what we desire most, and what we desire most is what we have deemed to be of utmost value. What captures our eyes is where our hearts are. So there's a connection now between eyes to body because the eye uh, fixes on what we do, truly want, and then it, it acts as a lamp that affects our souls. Well, treasures are what we value most our eyes are what we ultimately pursue what does my soul ultimately seek what in my life is sought after most by me and what jesus does here is he relates these things about the heart to the treasure and eye to the body and now keep in mind when he talks about heart it is the deepest part of yourself. That was the Hebrew understanding of the person, was that your heart was the deepest part of yourself and what you truly wanted, what you ultimately desired and pursued. And then Jesus goes on in talking about the eye. And he says, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. So now here's the practical part. Now there's this connection between eye and body. So what we need is we need a healthy eye so that you have a body that's full of light. You, if you're, the eye is a lamp, it's, then you want the eye to be healthy so it shines light into your body so your body is then full of light. But what does it mean by having an eye that is healthy? Is it about looking at the right thing? Is it about not being like a boo, looking at the ruby and you shouldn't be looking at that? Of course, from the previous section that we looked at from verses 16 to 18, that's implied as well. It's implied that you ought to be fixed on heavenly treasures and not earthly treasures. And so it's implied that you should be, your eyes should be fixed on the right things. And yet, however, the word that Jesus chose to describe the eye as being healthy is not literally the word healthy in the original Greek. It is the word haplous. Haplous means singular. Now, in the context of this passage, it would seem to fit for the translators of our Bibles to say healthy, and that's correct. It means that it's something that's good, you know. So it is a positive thing, and it's a general kind of translation for this word, but, and yet, it doesn't fully explain what haplus, Jesus' choice word, meaning singular, actually conveys. And why does he say singular? Why does he not simply say healthy? What does it mean that if your eye is singular? It doesn't sound like it makes much sense without an explanation, right? <laughs> so what was Jesus getting at in saying singular? Is it about what we're pursuing? That if we fix our eyes on heavenly treasures, that which matters to God, then our eyes will be a lamp that shines a light through our souls because where our treasure is, that is where our, our heart is as well. Um, is it that so is it like, like this image of, of looking at the Ark of the Covenant as a representation of the glory and the majesty and the kingship of God, and therefore our heart is also with God because that's what we value most? We value God's glory. We value God's kingship. We value a relationship with God. That's where our real treasure lies. Well, that would be implied as well, too, if, especially in looking at the previous context from verses 16 through uh, 18 and, and also from 19 to 21. That seems like there are two categories of types of treasures and your eyes have to be upon the right kind of treasure. And yet, but singular does emphasize something else. That what it is 
is not as much about um, how much of something or uh, what the something is, uh, that, but rather there should be just a one thing, singular, one thing. It's the single thing that captures our gaze, that we're pursuing, that we value most. A singular eye is a focused eye that is devoted to gazing at one thing. Jesus' emphasis here is not in the what. He dealt with the what in the previous context, from verses 19 to 21. That's where he dealt with the what. The what was between earthly treasure and heavenly treasure, and now he's dealing with something else, with this choice word of singular. He's dealing with devotion versus duplicity. Devotion versus duplicity. Because if you had another treasure your eye is on, then you're not completely focused. Uh, If you're pursuing something else and your heart is somewhere else at the same time as another thing, so you got two things going on, then there's duplicity happening. Remember, your heart is where your treasure is. So if your eyes are on two things, it's not singular, then your heart is in two places. This is duplicity. This is a, a divided heart. This heart is in conflict with itself, which easily leads to hypocrisy. Because you may be saying you're pursuing one thing, but you're actually also pursuing something else in your life. And as verse 23 says, if your eye is evil, it will shed darkness into your soul. So the opposite of singular is evil or wicked or bad, meaning that it is duplicitous. It is divided. A soul that is full of light is flourishing. A soul that, is, that has light shining upon it because your eyes and what you pursue is completely focused, devoted, and committed. That shines light into your soul. But a soul divided and duplicitous without devotion and commitment to God, is darkened, torn, conflicted, and empty. Now, Jesus is not talking about um, having two jobs versus one job. You know, sometimes sometimes we feel torn over that, right? But that's more of a practical thing of of time. Uh, He's not talking about whether you should have one child or two kids. You know, he's not talking about that. (laughs) What he's talking about are matters of the heart. Remember from verses 19 to 21. They're matters of the heart, meaning what you ultimately desire and pursue at the very core of your being, what your eyes are ultimately pursuing. What is the one thing you desire most that makes sense of everything else? What is your one true north? Your one true north that makes sense of every other direction. You know, that's the fascinating thing with the compass, right? The compass doesn't tell you every direction. It only tells you one direction. It tells you north, right? But because it tells you north, once you know what north is, you know every other direction. It's that one thing that makes sense of everything else. What is that one thing in your heart that makes sense of everything else? Because that is the most valued treasure in your heart. And that's what your eyes are fixed upon and gazing upon. And that's what you're looking for, is you're looking for your true north. Recall what led up to this passage. Jesus was addressing religious people who prayed to God, but did it so that others would notice them and so that they can get social applause and social credit and approval and likes (laughs) for what they were doing. Because then they, they can flaunt that and show off, look how holy, look how spiritual we are, which especially in this society, that was a social commodity. That was something that people valued. So on one hand, they're praying to God, um, and they want God's attention, they want God's approval, but they also want to do it in front of others. Because they want other people's attention. They want other people's approval. They want credit from other people as well, too. They want both. They want to be able to praise God and get praise from people. They want to be able to please God and be people pleasers at the same time. Uh, They want to lay up treasures in heaven and on earth. (laughs) They were conflicted and duplicitous. And that's why Jesus addressed them in verses 16 to 18 in the previous context. Do not be like these religious people, he's telling his disciples who pray, but they are actually doing it for social approval and gain, and, but rather pray in secret so that nobody else sees you except God. And that's your single, singular eye. 
Your singular eye is where you're living for an audience of one. So you can't look at these folks and conclude that they're being genuine. Are they being spiritual for God? Or are they being spiritual as a show for us? Maybe both. How can it be both? It's, it's that previous context that leads into our passage here where Jesus teaches that at the heart level, you can't be divided. You can't be divided. It's like when I used to, used to, by the way, <laughs> watch The Bachelor. And I got so angry with that show. <laughs> I know our executive pastor, Bob, and I, sometimes we have a good laugh in the office. It's been years since I have watched The Bachelor. If you look at this slide here, I don't even know who these people are, but I just simply Googled one guy in love with two girls, one bachelor in love with two girls, and this popped up. And it, that seemed to happen quite often to me, it's from what I saw in the show, is the, the, the bachelor is saying that he's in love with two women. I'm in love with her, and I'm in love with her. <laughs> you know, and I'll be in love with her too, and, and I love you too over there. You know? And I wish I, had, I could just give a rose to all three, four of these women. <laughs> and I think to myself, how can this be? How can you be in love with two women, <laughs> let alone three or four? You know, uh, how, can you, how can your heart be given in such a way to multiple people? At the heart level, if you're in love, if, if there's a genuine pursuit for a person whom you want to spend the rest of your life with, it can't be divided, can it? Can you, maybe you can have a crush on two people, possibly, but at the heart level, can you actually be in love with two people? It's a contradiction within yourself, a conflict, and perhaps a lying to one, maybe both people, and plus a lying to yourself. Can you be in love in so many ways? Maybe by my calculated mind, I can't compute how this can happen because a human heart doesn't seem to be built that way. That's what Jesus was getting at. Duplicitous hearts cannot function. You will ultimately serve what you value or who you value the most. The object of your desire at the heart level, that's whom or what you will serve. And that's what he says in verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. What you pursue is what you're going to work for and strive after. You're going to invest attention, thought life, time, focus, and energy towards the one thing, the one person you ultimately love most. And here's the final connection Jesus gives us. At the bottom line of the heart level, it's about your love. Who and what you love most. Matthew 22, 37 to 38 says that the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. What God asks for, what God calls for, is for us at the heart level to love Him, to value Him, to lay up treasures that, that would match with His glory, that what we would value most is of his approval is the, the, the magnifying of his glory and the building of his kingdom. And here's a reality about love. Love always has competition. There will always be something out there that competes with your love for someone, whether it's work, priorities, ambitions, character flaws even, or old habits, sins, that we carry with us, that may compete with our love for God. There will always be something that competes with your love for God. The competition doesn't always kick the other competitor out, but simply may cause you to compromise so that you are divided and not fully devoted, so that you may be tricked into thinking, I can have both. I can have God and my sin. <laughs> I can have God and also my self-pride and my self-arrogance. Uh, I can have God and also live for myself. I can have God and also I can live for other people. I can have both. And that's why Jesus said in the previous context to lead up to this passage that lays out the, the, the background, the context for us, and is that you can't have both. 
So that's why he tells the disciples, if you're going to pray to God, go into a secret place. Because now no one can see you, and you're not doing this for any kind of social approval. You're not doing it for the number of likes that you can possibly get. (laughs) You're doing this because this is between you and God, and that's the object of your affection, is God the Father. And in those times when competition comes, when those times where we have to make practical choices, choices where it's either God or this other thing, And to have a singular eye, it means I'm going to choose God over and over again. It means saying to God, I'm going to choose you, God, over and over again. In the midst when our love for God is challenged by something else, we say, I choose you, God, again. And that choice that we oftentimes have to make is one that's made regularly and daily. And because we make this choice daily, because we make this regular choice of I'm going to choose God and not going to click on that website. I'm going to choose God and I'm not going to become a a workaholic that then is living such a life that is hurtful to my family and is not honoring God. I'm going to choose God versus my old habits. I'm going to choose God versus my old vice. I'm going to choose God versus my own selfish ambitions. And when we do so, this is where our love for God is fierce. We love God fiercely because of this. It is not a thin, weak, or superficial love. It is a love with a singular eye that is devoted, committed, and undivided for our Lord. And what we find when we do that is that all of the things that are honorable, worthwhile, starts to fall into place because our love and our heart is in the right place. Our marriages, our families, our parenting, things fall into place because our heart is in the right place. Again, Jesus is not talking about what you should eat on Thursday night. <laughs> He's not talking about what you know, vacation you have, Paris or London. You, know, you have both of those. It's, he's talking about at the heart level. He's talking about your ultimate pursuit and what your eye is most fixed upon. What is your greatest treasure? For some of us, our greatest treasure is our own self-independence and not having to live by God's rules. We want to have God, but not God's moral rules. We want to have God, but we also want to have a love for money. We want to have God, but we also want to have comfort and convenience. Or as Jesus is addressing here, we seem to want both. We want God and our moral independence, and our love for money, and our comfort and convenience. But as Jesus indicated in verse 24, it will always end up with you loving one and not the other because your heart can't remain divided. In the end, one will truly become your God and God, not so. This is what the Pharisees in the previous context were doing in verses 16 to 18. They were wanting praise from God and praise from people. They couldn't choose. They were duplicitous in their heart. But in the end, the greatest love was really for themselves. The people pleasing wasn't because they cared about other people and, and really what how, the well-being or the welfare of other people, what they cared about was themselves and the accolades and applause that they got for themselves and, and, and their own self-absorption. And sometimes that's one of the biggest competitors for our love of God is ourselves, our own self-love our own sense of what we want for ourselves. And if you look through the Old Testament, you'll find that this is one of the major issues God repeatedly deals with when it comes to his people. His people oftentimes had a duplicitous heart. They wanted God and their idols. They wanted God and their way of life that was not congruent with God's ways. They wanted God and also their their moral independence from God. Duplicity is not new to God. So be aware that duplicity is a temptation that tells us we can have both, that tells us that we can have God plus this. But all it creates at best is a divided heart, not a devoted heart. And in the end, you'll end up sacrificing one in order to hang on to the other. As we know, love only works with devotion and commitment, right? Any of us who have pursued seriously relationships, without that devotion, that commitment, love just doesn't work. 
And so this is what it means to have a singular eye. It's an eye that is ultimately devoted and pursuing with commitment God. A person with a singular eye is a person who is devoted and committed. So personal flourishing, according to Jesus' teachings, if you want light in your soul, uh, if you want treasures that will not deteriorate, then love God fiercely with a singular eye so that our hearts reside with Him. Our hearts reside where He is. And that's where the real treasure is. It's time to refocus our love. He's calling for a fierce love of Him. Then you will see how your love for God shines a light upon your soul. And that's where personal flourishing happens. Your personal flourishing is determined and dictated by where, what your ultimate love is and whom you ultimately love, self or God, money or God, comfort or God. Well, as we come to the end of this passage, Jesus actually isn't done here. Because as you look into verse 25, he starts off that sentence with therefore. <laughs> so he's still going on. And he makes another connection. And that other connection is between worries and our treasures. <laughs> so he goes on, but uh, you know what? We'll probably have to save that for another day. Jesus continues to appeal through the layers, but I think we have already done enough here, haven't we? <laughs> well, today is also Communion Sunday. And as you think about having a singular eye for God, as you think about where your treasures are and where your heart is that follows that, and as you think about whom you genuinely love with an undivided heart, as you think about those things, would you come to the table of Christ? As you come before the elements, we share in this communion together. You may have your elements in your living room, I have mine here. But as we partake of this together, we are coming in the Holy Spirit by faith to the table of Christ together. So if you haven't gathered your elements yet, please do so now. Take that moment to gather your the bread, the crackers, or the wafers that represents the body of Christ, to gather the juice, the cider, or the wine that represents the blood of Christ. Could even be Gatorade, fruit punch color, if you like. <laughs> Traditionally, it was anything that was of a red color would be su sufficient. And we, as we read the word of God over the elements, we will partake of it together. And our passage comes again from Matthew. From Matthew 26, verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. After blessing it, broke it, and gave it to, his, to the disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body. Would you take the body of Christ in your hands? As we break this bread together, I'm going to say a prayer for us as we partake together. Heavenly Father God, Lord, as we come before the body of Christ that was broken and sacrificed for us, We remember, Lord God, in this moment how you have redeemed us to be a people who would love passionately and love rightly. To be a people who would have hearts, hearts that you have redeemed and reclaimed that would be undivided before you. To truly experience flourishing because you have called our hearts to value you above all else. We thank you, God, for the sacrifice of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's partake of the body of Christ together. And in verse 27 it reads, And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This drink represents the blood of Jesus and represents the forgiveness of Jesus because of his sacrifice for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for Jesus' sacrifice. We thank you, Father God, that you held nothing back and Jesus held nothing back, but sacrificed himself and spilled his blood for 
our forgiveness of our sins. And we pray, Father God, that as we partake of this drink, Lord, that we are reminded of the grace that flows from you through us in order to redeem hearts that would be fully devoted to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's partake of the blood of Christ together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we know, God, that you love us, Lord. There's no doubt about that, even as we have partaken of these elements, we're reminded of your vast and immense love for us. We pray, Father God, that as we sit here at this table of Jesus, as we sit with you, we pray, Father God, that our hearts may be inspired to love you with sheer devotion and commitment, that our eyes might be fixed upon you and let it be that our, the fixation of our eyes on you and our love for you that sparks light in our souls, and that we would genuinely experience flourishing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together Nothing is
love the transformation message of that song. Uh, we want to take some time now to pray over the offering. So um, just as a reminder, you can drop off the offering. Um, if you want to stop by the church, you can drop it in the mail slot. You can mail it, or you can go to emmanuelburbank.churchcenter.com, and you can just donate there. Uh, would you join me in prayer? Thank you, God, that you have already won the victory. I thank you that we can rest in that, that we can know that nothing can take away what you have already done. God, we are in awe of you. And as we take this time to offer to you, Lord, that it would go beyond this time, Lord, that we would go from here into the week, Lord, offering to you and just laying ourselves down and focusing on you, God, that you would be first, that you would be our first love. I thank you for this time. I thank you for being able to glorify you in this way. I pray that you would be at the forefront of our hearts and minds. In your precious and holy name, Jesus. Amen.
you guys. I hope that you have really been genuinely blessed this Sunday. I want to remind us that we have our congregational meeting to follow at 11 a.m. There's no seven-minute mixer, um, but I hope you can all join us for this um, congregational meeting um, via Zoom. Let me pray for us, and as we go forth in this week and pursue passionately to love God fiercely. Heavenly Father, we pray, God, that you would ignite in us a heart that loves you and exercises love for you. Make us aware of things that compete against that love that we are having for you. And we pray, Father God, that you would uh, do a surgery upon our hearts. Let us know, God, what's going on inside of our hearts. Where are we hurting? Where are we distracted? What are the things that hinder us? And would you work out those things in us, Father, so that our hearts may be whole and undivided. We lift this up to you, God, and we know, God, as we go forth in this week, we know, God, how much you passionately and fiercely already love us through Jesus. In your son's name we pray, amen. God bless you all.